Hello and welcome to a millinery book review live stream. <laughs> I hope everyone is well. It's very hot in London today. Very, very warm indeed. So um, sometimes I start the stream off by talking about what I've been doing the whole week. This time round, I'm just going to say if it's hot where you are, make sure you have a glass of water with you because being thirsty is not good for you. <laughs> this is a very different way of doing a sound check. Right. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> welcome, 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 welcome. I'm very excited for this next series of live streams. There's going to be four live streams, one a month for the next four months about my book collection. It's not necessarily that I recommend all these books to you, but it's more about what books I have and what I've taken from each book. And if you decide that you would like to take that information as well from a book, then you can go and buy that book. And incidentally, all the books I'm going to be talking about are in the description box below. We've got the title, author and um, publication, the original publication date. So some of these books have been republished several times of the years. Some of these are modern reprints. Some of them can be found online for free. So I'm not going to actually link to any books because depending on what country you're watching from, I know we have quite an international audience. Um, you will be able to find these books from different retailers in your local area. Um, and some of them can be found online. And actually the one link I will put in the description box and maybe um, my moderator, Matthew, who is also my husband, can find the, um, the link to a website called archive.org and just pop that in the chat straight away because a lot of millinery books that are out of print and out of copyright are available through this wonderful free library research place on the internet. So you can go and have a look at that as well. Right. Oh, that's so many people joining me already in the chat. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Where's everyone joining me from? I said we have an international audience. Where is everyone coming from today? While you all let me know where you're coming from, I'm just going to sort out my computer so that I can present all the wonderful information from the books to you. Right. Can I see that? Not very well. Sorry, everyone. Just double checking my settings. Chat amongst yourselves. Oh, if you've already seen the list of books, do you guys um, have any of them? <laughs> um, Haberdashery Project from my sofa. Wonderful. That could be anywhere in the world, welcome. Um, Michael, lovely to see you again, a regular on the live streams, hi. Um, Midwestern United States. Angeles from Madrid, hola. <laughs> and the other moderator in the chat today is Rachel from Labricalus, and she's in Durham, and she's got thunderstorms in the forecast, oh dear. <laughs> Evelyn from London drinking tea. Isn't it too hot for tea? I'm in London too and I'm absolutely sweltering, hence the sparkling water with cucumbers and lemons, which matches my outfit. <laughs> right, let's not waste time. Or rather, let's not waste time talking about weather, which is very British of us. Let's jump into what have I done this past week? <laughs> I've made this. Sorry, got lemon on my lips now. I'm... Oh, <clears throat> oh, is the background music not working? There it is, background music now. So here's what I've made this week. This is a little straw hat. I, I, I don't know. Well, it's not really a hat, is it? It, it doesn't have a base big enough to be a hat. Although, I think it might pass for Ascot, because for Ascot you have to have a 10cm base. This is at least 10cm. Um, but it's using vintage oranges and lemons, sing the bells of St. Clements, 
and vintage grapes, which for some reason, when I redid the leaves, I think they now look like olives, but it would be weird to put fresh olives in your fruit basket, so we're going to say that they're grapes. <laughs> and there will be a video coming on this at some point as well, when I get round to editing it, but isn't that lovely? I would put it on, but I'm wearing another hat, but a preview. It's like this, and it's on a wire frame, so this would the wire frame would tuck under my hair and it holds in place quite well. It is a bit heavy though. <laughs> and I also want to follow up on something I may have mentioned in a previous stream, I can't remember if I did or not, but a long time ago, well, it's relatively recent, but it also feels like a long time, I went along to a hat block sale that John Boyd hats were having, and I bought this stuff, which I would have just called, whoops, see, there's a lot of it, there's a lot of it here. I would have called this blocking net. Let's switch camera views. Am I focused? No, let's just quickly focus that. There we go. So I would have called this blocking net and I would use it as blocking net. So if you don't know, blocking net is used as a turban foundation. It's nice and soft and malleable, so it's not as hard as buckram, which dries quite hard, but blocking net is nice and soft. So it, it kind of keeps its, um, it keeps its shape without feeling like a helmet. Um, and I was reading through the pile of books that I have prepared for this stream, and I came across an interesting picture and an explanation of what this stuff might be. This stuff might in fact be something called Maylene, which was used as a foundation for lace covering or for mohair plaque. I don't know what this means. This book is from 1925 or 29 or something. We'll, we'll get onto what this book is, but there was a picture here of it on a hat. Here it is. And this looks remarkably similar to how this what I would have called blocking net looks when I'm blocking it for a turban. It does kind of look like it's in three or four layers here. I've blocked it in two for turbans, but that's interesting. I now know more than I did yesterday, which is fun. So it's always good to read some millinery books, especially if you're mainly self-taught like me. I always feel because I'm mainly self-taught, I'm always looking for new sources of information and I really really enjoy reading books so it's always good for that. Right, now that we've finished the segment on what I've done <laughs> and how hot it is in London today, let's move on to the books. So in this, oh my hands are all sticky now from the mailing, oh well, let's hope they, okay no it's fine, it's fine, it's not too sticky. Um, this first stream is all about books that I have classified to be textbook, manual, how-to type books. There will also be a stream on specific hat books that take you through making hats project by project, which I've put in a different category because I think it's a different style of learning. So if you're interested in, like, I don't want to use the word dry, but if you're interested in very much lesson style, first learn this, then learn this, then learn this, this set of books could be for you. Let's have a look at what I've got. Once again, it's in the description box and I'm going to go through these in chronological order. Oh, yeah, let's, let's do it this way. Right, I've got this first book, which is Edwardian Hats, the Art of Millinery 1909, written by Madame Anna Ben Youssef, who was a milliner, I think, in New York. And this is thought to be one of the first millinery manuals. So I think there might have been a few other ones around the time, but I think this was at least one of the most popular ones. And to be honest, it was probably one of the most popular ones because it is actually very well written. It's not too dry. If you've ever read books from previous centuries, because the way we phrase sentences has changed, and you'll notice a difference from this 1909 book to the last book of today, which I think was published in the mid 80s, you will notice there is a difference in sentence style and structure. 
Um, oh, Rachel says, I wrote my master's thesis on her daughter, Zaida Ben Youssef. Oh, interesting. Can we read your master's thesis, Rachel? Can you link us to it somehow? That sounds really fascinating. <laughs> I'm going to be taking a lot of pauses today to drink my water. Right. What's in this book? Um, well, oh, okay, I'll start again. What, th the way I would like to structure these reports, I'll call it reports rather than reviews, because my, the aim of this is to, as I've already said, give you all an idea of the kind of content in these books and what you might take from it rather than like a traditional book review where you might um, comment or critique the content or the author's writing style. I'm not qualified to do that, but I think I can kind of tell you about what's in these books and what I like about them and also what I dislike about them. I'm not normally a negative person, but there's some things in these books that are just a little bit mm, questionable in the modern day. We'll get on to that. The format is going to be this. For every book, I'm going to tell you what I think the style of the book is. So how it's written, how it's presented. Then I'm going to tell you what I think the intended target audience is for the book. So the original target audience and maybe compare it to who might want to buy it today. Then we'll have a look at a few bits of notable content from within each book because each of these different books has different merits and you might want to buy a different book for one thing and then even though it has a chapter on the same thing have a look at another book that has the same chapter but it's written better or something like that so we'll have a look and compare some of that and also why I bought the books I mean I'm, I'm gonna spoil this straight away most of the books in this section I bought because Rachel recommended them through her series of book reviews and um, Another milliner who's got a really good series on book reviews where she really takes a deep dive into the content of the books, more so than I'm going to be doing today, is SH Millinery. You can find her channel also linked below. So go and have a look at that if you haven't got enough books from today. Uh, oh, and the last point of every book, who I think should read the, these books now in the modern day, who is the modern target audience, if you like, for these books that are really really old. Right, so the first book, Edwardian Hats, The Art of Millinery, 1909, Madame Ben Youssef. Uh, we've already said potentially one of the first millinery books. Let's dive into who I think the target was for these books. I think the target for these books was millinery students who were perhaps already in an apprenticeship and wanting to impress their employees by reading some information in their spare time away from the millinery studio. It's split up very much into lessons, but it does assume a little bit of knowledge of hand sewing already. So you've got to be comfortable with that. None of these, none of these books are going to tell you how to thread a needle and how to do a, a plain stitch or something like that. You, you would want to buy a, um, sewing textbook, I think, for that, if, if you needed help with that. These are mainly taking your seamstress knowledge and applying it to millinery. Notable content. This... Oh, let's switch the camera view so you can see it. So you can see it's, it's in the format of lesson two, making wire frames. I think this is what this book is designed for. So turn of the century, 1909, Edwardian hats. This is the time of big, big, massive wireframe hats. So if you think about the musical My Fair Lady, um, the big hats, obviously over-exaggerated in that musical production, but this is the kind of book that's going to help you make books like that. So maybe if you're a theatrical milliner, this is the chapter you should read. It takes you through tools necessary for working with wire, these illustrations, that are, I think, very useful if you don't want to read the whole thing because it is a bit... I, I did find myself zoning out as I was reading. It is a bit boring, this one. Um, but the illustrations are particularly useful to see how you might want to manipulate wire and how to make the wire frame. 
when I was experimenting with wireframe hats, I found this is the most useful book resource. So you can see here, it's showing you how to do it. Dome crowns. You might remember from a video I did on making Jackie Kennedy's inauguration hat, I made a wireframe for it. I used this book as a reference guide to that. So wireframes, if you're interested in that, the, the applications of wireframes, they're not just for these Edwardian hats, but they, they could have applications in making your own blocks, for example. So it's always useful to know how to make a wireframe, but I would say that that's an advanced millinery technique. So you might not necessarily want to start by making wireframe hats. This is, you've done your felts, you've done your straws, you've done your buckrams, you want the next level up, I would say wireframes. Ah, and Rachel says in the chat, we use this as a reference text in my theatrical millinery, millinery class when learning wireframe structure. It's very technical and the tone is kind of pompous, but the diagrams are great. Yes, pretty much exactly. Um, <laughs> so if you want to laugh at pompous language, have a read of this book. Um, another really interesting chapter in this book, and there's another book that I'm going to get onto next, which is essentially the same content, but written two decades later. Uh, one decade later even, or two decades, I'm very bad at maths, we'll do that calculation when we get to it, is morning millinery. This is something that we don't get today. So if you don't know, mourning is a period of grief when you are grieving for someone who has died or you're remembering someone, and it was a way of life in the Victorian times. And the Edwardian times, there was a lot more death than we see now because we didn't have good medicines, we hadn't invented penicillin yet, or we haven't discovered penicillin yet. So a lot of people would die from things that you wouldn't normally die from today if you get the right hospital treatment. And so a lot of the time, a lot of women were in mourning and mourning was a big period that it had specific time frames where you would in like the f I, I don't know the exact dates this is something that you can go and look up later but you would have like a month of wearing only black and then you could transition into deep navies and deep purples and very slowly you would come out of mourning gradually by changing the colors that you were wearing which would signal to social people around you what state you were in, how ready you were to interact with society once again, which I actually think is very useful and maybe we should bring back these ideas a little bit so that, you know, visual signifiers of when people would like to be left alone or if people would like to be spoken to, you know, signify it with a hat or an outfit. This is, I think, very relevant still today, but we don't really go in for all the morning stuff. But I think I think this is a good chapter to read in this book, not necessarily that you're going to make things, but if you're interested in hat history or fashion history, this details the specific fabrics that someone would have used, this details how these fabrics are to be worked with. So for example, let me read you a little bit to give you a flavour of how the book is written as well. Oh, are we focused? Let's see, can you guys see the text? Hopefully that's focused. This is from the Edwardian Hats um, book. This is page 114, lesson eight, morning millinery materials. The materials used are, first of all, crepe in black and white. This comes in a number of grades of quality, some dull, some glossy, some crisp, some so soft that if gathered into a handful, it will not crush but of all makes, the waterproof is to be preferred. So already you can see the array of materials that are available to a seamstress and a milliner at the turn of the century in 1909. I mean, we're slightly past turn of the century, but 1909 is much wider than the kind of technical fabrics that you can find today. I spent a whole day in London's fabric shop district, Goldhawk Road, uh, during the week looking for, of all things, a rainbow striped cotton or linen. Nowhere. Nowhere had rainbow striped cotton or linen. And if they didn't have rainbow striped cotton or linen, I doubt they would have some waterproof black crepe. 
But it takes you through various things. And once again, we've got very good diagrams of what's going on. You can, you can kind of read this book by just looking at the diagrams. So if you're a picture person and you don't want to read, this can be quite good. Wayne from the Haberdashery Project says, I've always found the period of mourning extremely interesting, so I would de uh, definitely like to see the chapter in detail. Thanks for the uh, for the information. Great. <laughs> Recommendation. Yes, thanks, Wayne. <laughs> Bit of a typo. Um, yes, well, hold your horses, Wayne, because you might not want to buy this book. You might want to buy this book. They are practically the same. They're written slightly differently, but the diagrams are the same. And I think this one's much thicker. So this second one here, this is millinery for every woman. And uh, it's by Georgina K. Kerr, uh, Kerr, Georgina Kerr K. even, and it was published in 1926. So that's, oh dear maths, it's about a decade, no, 1909, 1919, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 17 years after, oh dear. This is, um, this is very exposing, isn't it? I can't do maths. <laughs> or at least I can't do maths in my head, sorry everyone. But okay, the first one was 1909, this one is 1926, so you can all do the maths yourselves. I won't embarrass myself anymore. <laughs> And this is practically the same. So I would like to show you the illustrations. So if we go to the morning millinery chapter, this one has got a morning millinery chapter. Where is it? There it is, look at that. Morning millinery. And in the Edwardian hats, we had also, where was it? I think it was this post-it note. Yeah, morning millinery, this chapter here. Right? So, now look at these illustrations. Doesn't this look familiar? <laughs> and doesn't this look familiar? Oh look, they've added some shading. And they've taken the shading out in the more recent book. Um, Rachel says, I use this one as a reference when my theatrical millinery students learn about fabric and ribbon flower making. It's got a huge section on that. Yes, it does. And that's why we're going to come on to this. And this is why you might potentially, if you're looking to save some money, because sometimes books can be expensive, um, and you want to just buy one book, if you're going to pick between this one or this one, the millinery for every woman, I would pick the 1920s one. It's still got a wireframe section in it, so let's turn to that and have a bit of a comparison. There it is, the making of wire shapes. Here it is, the making of wire shapes. It goes through different kinds of wire, which these days we can't get hold of. So once again, if you're a historical costuming researcher, this could be quite interesting in finding out about the types of materials and tools that we no longer have access to. And I think it's a very interesting thought experiment when reading these books. I like to think about how would my hat designs differ if I had access to these tools and materials? Would I design the kind of hats that they did then? Or how could these materials and tools be used to design a more modern looking hat? Or, you know, something like that. Interesting thought experiment. If you've got a long commute and you like to spend your time thinking, it's great for that. So once again, we've got wireframes. We do have some pictures. So this book has actual photographs in it, whereas the other one was illustration only. So in fact, you're kind of getting a bit more in this book than you would in the other one. But I will show you, not that the pictures are great, by the way, you can't really see, the, the contrast on them is so fuzzy. Where were all the wireframes? Because it did have similar diagrams, there we go. It's th This is actual photos of the domed hat. It's of, of the dome, a square crown, upturned Breton. Oh, there we go. This This diagram is also in the Edwardian hats book. So there it is. Um, let me unpack this book just a little bit more. So the style of this book, it is very much still written as a textbook, but it's not split up into lessons. 
it's this time it's just let me show you the contents it's it's just taking you through different types of knowledge for millinery which if you read to the end of the book you'll have all that knowledge but it's not taken into lessons or ordered in any kind of way like that the target audience for this once again back in the day when this was written i think this is written for semi-professionals looking to expand their knowledge these days i would say the target market is advanced millinery students doing research or if you're a milliner and you make hats professionally and you want to expand your knowledge and kind of look back at history this is a good book for that or if you're just starting out and you don't know what you're doing actually no no ignore me if you're just starting out and you don't know what you're doing this book is not going to be good for you because it's it is written in quite a dry way shall i read out an excerpt like i did for the other one let's go to maybe the uh pleating section maybe oh oh the, well this was what rachel was talking about all the various trims and fabric flowers and ribbons this has got a good section on pleating so it's got some interesting diagrams here once again uh, I don't want to read to you from the pleating. That bit's, I mean, you know, pleating is pleating. But, ah, the millinery morning chapter. Let's read from the millinery morning chapter because once again, it talks about various materials that are available. So chapter eight, morning millinery. Materials. The material used for deep morning wear is crepe in black and white. This material comes in a number of finishes, some dull, some glossy, some crisp, some so soft that if wadded tightly in the hand, they will not crush. Waterproof finished crepe is the most durable. Crepe de chine, the lusterless kind, chiffon, mousseline, de soie, crepe lisse, grenadine and tulle in black and white are used for less deep morning wear. That first sentence, I think was identical to the paragraph I read from the first book. So if you're interested in morning millinery and you want a book with lots of other things in it as well, get this one. But it does feel like it's really plagiarizing the other one. I don't know if they were really allowed to do that. I, well, I mean, you're not allowed to do that today, but clearly, unless they got um, permission for it, Uh, right. Other notable things. This this is a chapter I found quite interesting for research purposes. First, when I read the chapter name to renovate materials, I thought, great, I can apply this to buying vintage hats and restoring them. And then I started reading through it and it started talking about some very dangerous and dodgy chemicals. And I thought, no, no way. <laughs> this is not safe. So if you're going to buy a vintage millinery book, just be very aware that you probably shouldn't follow the advice verbatim. You want to read it and go, oh, isn't that interesting? And then put it away, close it up, and don't think about using those dangerous chemicals because they are dangerous. So there was a bit here, I think, where it talks about using gasoline to clean something. Does it talk about gasoline? Or maybe not gasoline. Oh, well, well, somewhere it says gasoline because it's got here in italics for your health and safety information. Avoid being near fire when using gasoline. Obviously. Um, but my advice would be don't use gasoline. Uh, Rachel says... I don't think either of these authors made any money off these books in terms of royalties um, on the writing itself. All of these old books have terrible suggestions like wash your feathers in gasoline. Oh gosh, yes. Um, I haven't read these books cover to cover because I do find them a bit dry, which is why um, maybe Rachel can fill in some of the gaps in my knowledge about these books that I haven't got there yet. I have read very specific chapters that apply to certain projects that I've been working on. Um, I clearly haven't worked with feathers enough because I haven't needed to dive into this book and read about washing feathers with gasoline, but maybe don't do that. Let's go through to my last post-it note. Oh, this is all the, um, 
this is some interesting stuff about making flowers. One thing I'm always interested in, personally, is making my own stamens because I find modern stamens are, whilst they're very lightweight, I don't like the pearly finish that you get on them. I like a matte stamen. So I like to make the stamens myself and then I want to know, you know, different ways of making them. There's obviously, you can use semolina and turmeric, which I did in one of my flower making videos. You can mix up a kind of toothpastey mixture. Whoops. Oh dear, my laptop's about to cut out. I've been having lots of laptop issues. Give me one second, everyone, while I make sure my laptop doesn't cut out. Oh no, it's fine. It's charging again. Oh dear. My computer is showing its age. It's all fine. It's all fine. Husband ran to the rescue. Okay. I would like to read a little bit from this book once again. This is from the chapter on flowers. To make lily centers. If you cannot buy pond lily centers, you can make them by soaking pieces of newspaper thoroughly in water. Then cut white wire into two and a half inch pieces. This is a problem for me as well. It's all an imperial and I'm a metric girl. Twist a piece of the wet paper about three quarters inches wide and one inch long around one end of a piece of the wire. Press together between thumb and forefinger and roll up tight to absorb the moisture and to shape nicely round. See figure 507. So here is figure 507. I think that looks very, very interesting. And I think this is a very interesting thing for me to try. I've never made lilies before. Maybe um, when I have some time, which I don't have at the moment, <laughs> we can try making some lilies together using this book. That would be fun. Let me know if you'd like to see that. Sorry, everyone, just preparing for my next book. Right, that's the two turn of the century hats. Oh, has the internet suddenly gone? What is happening? Also, I'm wondering, I've got my windows open. Can everyone hear the trains going past my window or is the audio okay? <laughs> just while I take a water break. You will let me know how it's going. <laughs> okay, next book. I'm just going to cut to the chase on this one over here. This is my favorite book of the whole lot. If you are looking to get into millinery, just buy this book because it's great. Or even, you don't need to buy this book. This is one of those that's available for free. I don't think it's on the archive.org, but if you just Google search for this title, you will find it. Right, so what is this magical book? It's called How to Make and Trim Your Own Hats by V. Powell. And I absolutely love this book. getting my notes bigger on the screen so I can see what's going on. Right. What's the style of this book? It's informal. It's kind of written a bit like a hobby magazine. So if you think about um, Threads magazine, you know, for sewing, it's kind of written a bit like that. It's it's a bit kind of hello and um, kind of a bit like I like to present my my videos. So if you're if, if you like how I speak, and how I present, then you'll probably enjoy this book very much. Um, target audience, millinery hobbyist, written in 1944, but still very much applicable to a millinery hobbyist today and back then. And it's especially good if you want to learn how to remake and retrim hats that you already have, because this is this is a book focusing on the make do and mend mentality present around the second world war and for a little bit afterwards while rationing was still going on um notable content let's go through that so we've got a chapter on 
block modifications. Which post? -it you see how well this, how well loved this book is. I have so many post-it notes in it. Some of these post-it notes are not relevant to today's stream. They're just pages that I like for myself. And yeah. So block modifications. You might remember my video on what did I call it? On making the bow batons hat. You know, with the pointy tip, the the felt with the pointy tip. I got that idea from this book. So it says, look, if you've got one of your head blocks, a poupe head, you can put a little wooden block on it or a cardboard block or wrap some rope around. You can also use cord, um, electrical cord. I go through this all in that video and it tells you how to block on it. It's all very accessibly explained. It's written in a way that anyone can understand, that, that a non milliner can understand. So it does assume that you know how to sew already. It's not going to take you through that. In fact, I don't even know if it has a list of materials. It might not have a list of materials. The illustrations are just gorgeous. These illustrations. I look at these illustrations and I just want to make every single one of these hats. Uh, let's see, is there a chapter on materials? There is kind of a chapter on materials, but unlike the other books, the previous books, these books had diagrams, and there's some books later on that I'm going to get onto that all had illustrations of millinery tools. These don't, these just list them, but all the tools that it lists, I think are still available today. So it could be more relevant than, than before. It even tells you here the differences between what we in the UK call Petersham and um, nylon or polyester grow grain. I'm aware that in the US, I think you call millinery Petersham millinery grow grain, but in the UK we differentiate and it, it tells you about that. It tells you how to measure your head. We've gone through the block modifications. Let's see what else have I post-it noted to talk about. Oh, half hats. Someone in my comments was asking me about half hats. I'm so sorry I don't remember your name, but I remember that you asked me about half hats. So if you're interested in half hats, um, have a look at this book. You can get it for free. Um, so it tells you how to make an earmuff hat or a, uh, a Dutch half bonnet or curvette. Look at these. These are just so lovely. I am wearing a half hat today. I call them callow half hats just because if I use the word, the term callow, people normally don't know what I'm talking about. It's a French term. So I always say half hat, but I, I would prefer it if everyone started using the term callow because um, that's what it is. Anyway, um, other interesting things in this book, again, with the make do amend, it tells you what the style is in 1944. So, if, um, <laughs> what's wrong? Out of shape, out of style, possibilities. Good, but must change style. <laughs> I'm just spotting on my streaming software that my video is getting a bit blurry and blocky and the frames per second is dropping. So if I could just check in with my tech support to make sure everything's okay. Other things that are very interesting, cutout crowns. This is very in, in the 40s and then in the 50s. It's not quite what this hat is, but it's very similar. Uh, ways to use old felt or straw crowns are numerous. Cutouts, such as those suggested in the illustrations, are interesting and easy to do. A trim can be added to accent the cutouts. Oh, did I cut out in the stream? Oh, it's fine now. Okay. Once again, it's a Sunday and we're having internet issues. That's a shame. Oh, and the other exciting thing in this book. I can't crochet, so this isn't exciting to me, but maybe you can crochet. It has a whole section of crochet hats. So if you know how to crochet, it tells you all the crochet things, um, which I don't know what they mean, but maybe you know what they mean. And if you know what they mean, let me know in the comments. <laughs> 
so exciting. Oh, it does take you through Hatpins as well, but then most of the books take you through Hatpins because that was kind of the number one universal way to attach hats to heads was Hatpins. We don't really do that today. I personally don't really like Hatpins, but um, if you're interested in that, it's got it here. And it's also got a chapter on bags, which is interesting. So it's, a, it's just a kind of accessory manual. So that's fun. Um, yeah, I think I've covered all the points on this one. This is my favourite book. Next one. Oh, this is my other favourite book. This one is called It's Fun to Make a Hat. It certainly is, we all know it is. By a lady called Hel Helen Garnell who I think was a Hollywood milliner at some point in her career. It's a very interesting book. It's semi-autobiographical. So it's giving you tutorials, but it is also saying, um, g giving you an overview of her life and where she was at certain points in her career. And it's just hilarious. I would recommend this book to anyone who just wants a good laugh and a good read. But the drawback is, is this book is exceptionally rare. It's very difficult to find. If you do find it, it might not have this cover. It might have another cover. It might have a cover that looks like this because this is an Amazon reprint book and it just uses a stock image. Um, so it might not look like this, but it's a very, very fun book to read. And I'm actually not sure who the target audience for this book would be because it's very... It's not quite like a lesson book. I think it's more intended as a... It's a book she wrote because she wanted to write it and so it doesn't feel like it has a proper target audience. What have we got in this book? Oh, the... This is what makes this book interesting, apart from the hilarious writing, which I will read something out um, in a second, but this is her way of explaining millinery to someone is saying you can take a basic shape, like a sailor hat, which is uh, like a boater, so it's flat top, um, cuff and flat brim, and you can take that and modify it in so many different ways to make different styles. And she takes you through all these modifications and tells you how to block something flat, how to then put it together. And once again, the illustrations are amazing. I think she illustrated it herself. She's got quite a talent, especially for funny illustrations. Here we go, look at this. This is apparently, this is all hats that you can make from a standard boater pattern. Maybe this is also something we can do one day, is have a look at that. Uh, Labrika Luce says, I love Milliner's autobiographies. There were several of them at this time. Lily Dashay wrote one called Talking, uh, Talking Out My Hats, Talking About My Hats, and that's such fun to read. I may have just purchased that one as a birthday present to myself, so I will be reading it, and it is included in the reading list for one of the live streams. But once again, please don't feel like you have to buy all these books, because some of them are very difficult to find, and um, this one kind of falls under this category as well. These are very much books for those of us who are interested in collecting obscure books, which is what I like to do. So that's why I bought this one, but I don't necessarily recommend that you absolutely must buy it, even though I do really like this variations of the sailor, how she's telling you how to modify the sailor to look like different styles of hats. And I think if you wanted to apply this knowledge to block making, you could. So if you wanted to take a, um, a sailor out of buckram and turn it into a tricorn like Helen has done here, if you reinforced the buckram enough, you could then turn that into a block that you could block cinema on, or you could block wool felt or straw. It doesn't have to just be buckram and fabric covered, because all these hats, as with a lot of 1930s and 40s hats, they would have been fabric covered hats, which is my speciality, which is why I'm interested in this, but you might not be. 
Um, let me find you an interesting thing to read. Let's find a fun thing where she talks about herself. I'm not the best reader, but I should have found... Okay, look. Here she's talking about, I think, one of her customers. Delightful Merle Oberon is another of my favourite customers, and another type all her own. She also has an almost perfect oval face with a broad, rounded forehead. With her dark hair and grey eyes, she can wear almost any colour and any shape, but very feminine hats also are most becoming to her. I like to accentuate her forehead by making clean-lined off-the-face hats for her. She can wear a small doll hat beautifully, and this brings me to a story which shows that necessity is the mother of invention. So then she goes into one of her stories, which is delightful. Merle telephoned me frantically one day and said, Helen, you've got to do something. I'm leaving by Clipper to London. I simply must have a lot of new hats, and I can only take one small bag. What can we do? <laughs> Since Miss Oberon, who in private life is Lady Corder, was scheduled to make a number of personal appearances in London as well as to be entertained by important personalities, it was clear that she must have hats, so I set to work and made a series of miniature chapeaux, called them half hats or even quarter hats, but they were gay, light-hearted and becoming. Obviously in this context, gay means happy and bright, which is the original meaning of the word. But how delightfully is that written? It, it fills me with joy reading this book. The one drawback is because this is an original book, I can't actually read it in bed. I have to read it at a table, which is why I haven't read through the whole of it because it's falling apart and I like to read in bed or I like to read on the tube. But this book has to be read on a table because I want to keep it in good enough condition so that it doesn't fall apart. And one thing I will potentially try and do with this book is to make a digital version of it and I will have to look into the legalities of that because I don't know if this is technically out of copyright but that's something that I want to look at and have a look because I think this writing it needs to be preserved alongside all of these delightful illustrations <laughs> so there we go oh and there's a series of pictures on the inside of this cover which I think look great so you can see there's these boater shapes that she was talking about these are all still things I need to try. I need to find time to try them. All right, we'll move on to the next book. The next book is a textbook of modern millinery by Ethel Ari Langridge. Langridge, even, sorry. I've run out of water so I'm going to need to take a water break soon. This book, once again, why did I buy it? It was recommended by Rachel for the chapter on Spartry, so um, that's why I bought it. I've never worked with Spartry. I think it was the Spartry one. Was it this one? Or what? The, there was there was a few Spartry recommended books. I haven't actually got round to reading the Spartry chapter in this book, but I have in, in the other book and we'll get onto that in a bit. Um, what is this book good for? Oh, target audience. Very helpfully, the author has told us what her target audience is, so I didn't have to guess on this one. The author says, In compiling this book, I have had in mind those who need a guide in technique when preparing for an examination, such as those of the City and Guilds of London Institute, as well as those interested in the trade as a whole. Perfect. I wish every book started out with a chapter telling us who it's intended for, because then we might know whether we should buy it or not. So, the City of Guilds London Institute, so there's a course called the City of Guilds Fashion Diploma, I think, and there's a level one and a level two, and then you go on to other levels, and that's the one I did with a focus in millinery. And I actually found this book really useful during the course because it wasn't structured very well and this book gave the course a bit more structure than was available in the modern reading material <laughs> so that's how i found it helpful so i don't necessarily think um your average person would like to buy this book i think if you could get your hands on it 
for free, like through an internet um, PDF, if there is one, then it's worth flicking through, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend you go out of your way to find it and pay for it, unless you're interested in the spa tree. So go and have a look at Rachel's video where she's going to take you through spa tree in this book. Um, so what did I like about this book? Trimmings, the chapter on trimmings, very useful. It takes you through various different types of trimmings and how to make them. Um, very useful illustrations of piping and rouleaus and things like that, which I really like to make. Again, pleatings. So if you're interested in pleatings, this book has got them. But if you've already bought the Georgina K. Kerr millinery book, you don't really need this one for pleating. But it does tell you how to do a cockade, which is what I go through in my millinery, uh, in my video on Mrs. Maisel's Catskills Infinity hat. So that's pretty much where I got the information for that video from. Methods of fixing bows, lots of bows. I really struggle with bows. So this, this book is good for me. Actually, the other books, the bows in them are very Edwardian. They're very big and floofy, and if you just wanted something a bit more streamlined and you struggle with bows like I do, these diagrams are very, very helpful in a way that the older diagrams aren't. I'm still trying to figure out bows. The other thing I liked in this book, actually, more than anything else, was this section on head movements and kind of head measurements. It's showing you where to put the tape measure on the head if you're trying to get a specific hat. So I think just having this illustration, if you're a visually minded person, this is very useful to see. And then it also tells you, oh, more. So you've got a beret, another type of beret, a um, straight pillbox. And then it tells you head sizes and how they're translated into inches or whatever the size is, which can also be useful because I think these are still very similar to how hats are sized today. And the other thing in this book, is this little section of history but don't be fooled this is taken from another book this is just straight up copied and pasted from this book and we'll talk about this book in a future millinery books stream so i'm not going to talk about it now but here it is this is called the mode in hats and headdresses by r turner wilcox and I will keep my opinions to myself until we get to it, otherwise you won't come and watch the stream. So if you're interested to find out what I think about this book, come and listen to that stream. Um, so we don't need to go through the history now. Oh, and this is my bookmark. <laughs> I don't know why I've taken it out. That bookmark was somewhere useful. Never mind, I'm going to have to find my place again. Um, so yes, I personally didn't enjoy this book too much, but it's useful if you're on the City and Guild millinery course. Next book. Oh, we're actually almost at the end, um, end of this stream. We've got two more books to go. So if you have any questions, please leave them for me in the chat. Or if you're watching on demand, leave me a comment below. I will come and hopefully answer them for you. Um, Evelyn says the pictures of the model's hands were my first uh, was my first millinery teacher. Her name was Helen Catton. Oh wait, in this book, in the in the model millinery, the, the the pictures of the model's hands. Where are the model's hands? Oh, these ones. Oh, isn't that fascinating? So Helen Helen Catton, and that was your um, first millinery teacher. I am going to look her up later on. I'm going to make a note somewhere, otherwise I will forget. Let me make a note. Getting a preview of my awful handwriting there. Okay, let's move on to, um, on to the next book. Okay, this is also one of my favourites. How to make hats by Eve Borat. Uh, Borat? Borat? Yeah, Eve Borat, I'm guessing. Written in 1967. Ooh. I've almost run out of water. Hopefully I'll be okay. Um, 
the style of this book. It's very informal, which is I think why I like it so much. It's very easy to read. I was sitting on the tube the other day and I read... How much did I read? Where's my bookmark? Is it going to turn out that I've lost my place again? Nope, here it is. So in about half an hour, I managed to read this much of the book because it is so easy to read. So if, if you don't like reading so much, but you would like to learn some millinery and all the other books look very text heavy to you, this one can be good for you. It's also got very good illustrations. Oh, and if you're wondering, this is this is my mum's cat Garfield. He's my bookmark in this book. So let's have a look. What are we going through? Lots and lots and lots of chapters on things, but I've marked some very specific things to look at. Oh, here is that illustration of tools and materials that you might need. I found this very, very helpful. Oh, Evelyn, um, so your tutor, Helen Catton, worked for Aggie Tarrup. I love Aggie Tarrup. His work is amazing. Um, I have his book. I have read it cover to cover several times. I love his work. I love looking at his hats at the VNA. And if no one else knows what I'm talking about, don't worry, I will get to him later on. He's a Danish milliner and he is so fantastic. I absolutely love all his hats. <laughs> You've got me all excited now. <laughs> um, okay, B back to this book. <laughs> um, I can't concentrate now. All I can think about is Aggie Tarrup. <laughs> um, okay, let's pause and take a question. So the Haberdashery Project, Wayne, asks, are you finding these little little treasures online or through local bookshops? Online? I am not very good at going to local bookshops, partly because where I live in London, we don't have any local bookshops. It's a very modern area. Um, if I had time to rifle through physical local independent bookshops, I would, but I don't so um, once again I think I bought this one with the recommendation of Rachel so the way I find books is I either stumble across them because I've got millinery searches set up on Etsy or eBay and if someone is listing a book that has something like millinery or hats in the title I, I get an email and then I go and look at it and I think oh do I, I how obscure is this book is this book obscure enough for me to want it <laughs> and then I will buy it if it is obscure enough for me to want it or um, other recommendations through people through other milliners through Rachel through SH millinery on YouTube as well she she's got a, a lot of lists of, of book reviews or just during courses if you go on some courses some teachers will give you a reading list and because I do like to burrow my head through a lot of books I get through them quite fast um, Evelyn asks, have you got his book Heads and Tails? I don't, I haven't managed to find that one. The Aggie Tarrup book that I have, what was it called? It was, I cannot remember what it's called, it's in the description box. Um, oh, it's called How to Make a Hat, I think. And it's one of the books that takes you through projects. I think I would love to have his book called Heads and Tails if I could find it. But yes, there we go. Um, Let's go back to this book. We'll talk about Aggie Tarrup in the other stream. I think it might be stream number four. If I've got that wrong, just check in the in the description box. Right. Good things in this book, How to Make Hats by Eve Borat. All the illustrations, once again, I really like these illustrations. When I started in millinery, I found it very difficult to understand what on earth people meant by type of face shape and how a hat should go with it. And I think this is the only book that illustrated this to me. So you've got here a rounded face showing how that is very well complemented with a sweeping brim and a quite a tall crown. Then you've got a something called a retrousse nose, which I'm guessing is just a nose that, that is quite um, curved, I think. Or retrousse even, there's an accent on the E. And how that's got an asymmetric shaped beret. A receding chin with a Mary Poppins style boater. 
pointed chin with a halo. So I think these illustrations make it really obvious what these things mean. Now, you don't necessarily need to stick to these rules. I am all for not sticking to these rules. But if you want to know what people thought people should wear based on face shape and body type in the mid-century, or specifically in 1967, this book is for you. I know that on some millinery and fashion courses it's a requirement to learn these things, so if you're struggling to learn these things, this book will tell you what kind of style some kind of face should have. I disagree with that, but if you want that knowledge, it's here. So it takes you through all of that. And this is an illustration of what not to do, which I can kind of see what they're going for. But at the same time, I think this enormous hat looks really fabulous on this lady with a small pointed chin because it it's playing with that contrast. And the same with the lady with the long tall face with a long tall fez and a feather. I think she looks fabulous as well. Anyway. Here's the chapter on, um, oh, before we get to the spa tree chapter, millinery stitches. I said earlier in the stream that these books don't tend to focus on types of stitches. Well, this one does. Um, hello, blood honey. Some unsolicited advice. Post-its leave a sticky residue on paper and it's a real pain on vintage books. I know I have a friend who is a paper expert and he will potentially tell me off for this just like you are. Rest assured, I'm going to take all these post-its post off as soon as we finish the stream. This is literally just my preparation for the stream. I'm about to take them all off. Don't worry, the books are fine. I take good care of all of these. <laughs> I know this technically isn't good care, but once again, it, the, these post-its have literally only been in overnight. So it's fine, don't worry about it. Not unsolicited advice at all. If anyone has any advice about anything, uh, well, maybe millinery and book related, pop it in the chat. We, we love to take on advice here. This is a, a learning community. Everyone can learn from each other. Um, oh, I wanted to read a little bit to give you all a sense of the writing style. So let's quickly do that. It is, of course, quite possible to make a block yourself. And I heard of one enterprising young woman who persuaded her grandfather to give her his ancient and battered top hat, which she promptly stripped after cutting off the brim. Then she steamed and manipulated the crown until it was the shape of her own head and glued an old hat stand inside. She packed the rest of the inside with sand, sealed it off with a circle of strong linen and thus made her own extremely efficient hat block. And this is my favorite bit. And incidentally, I'm told she washed the material she had stripped off the original top hat and made herself a very natty skull cap with it. <laughs> Once again, that make do and mend mentality coming through, which I really like. Um, I think it's really interesting to read about it because we went through a period of time in fashion where we forgot about that. And now we've circled back to sustainability and being conscious of the environment and our ecological footprint and we are embracing these ideas again which we should we should be doing so i encourage you all to do that um rachel says this one's super helpful for stitching diagrams yes so i've already noticed um i was about to say even that i think this is the best illustration of how to do a wire stitch so a wire stitch some people say it's different to a buttonhole stitch or a blanket stitch. I'm not very good with definitions, so I don't remember. I know that my hands remember what is the right one to do, but if you're struggling, this is the diagram. There it is. It's, it's very clear where the needle is going, where it's going in and out and under to stitch a wire to the edge of a brim. Uh, well, yeah, edge of a brim or crown. So I've read you that chapter. Ah, this is, this is the one with the spa tree. So, I have never used spa tree, es spa tree. I don't think I ever will. I cannot get my hands on any. You can get a replica spa tree from Japan. It's just too expensive. Maybe one day that would be an interesting thing to do on camera, just to show you all, like, actually what the Japanese stuff is like but then I think I have to pay import fees and all of that and I haven't figured that out yet. Maybe maybe once I run out of videos in the calendar this year, 
next year we can think about Japanese spa tree. And in, in that case, this book will become helpful. But it takes you through how to build, well, here you've got that same principle as Helen Garnell said with the boater shape as being pretty much the first thing someone ought to try. This is the, how to join the espartry. So espartry has a kind of willow, well not willow, it's kind of grass straw on one side and a muslin cloth on the other. And there's a special way to join them so that it becomes invisible under fabric. It just takes you through how to how to work with it. So if you'd like to find out about that, even though you can't work with Spartry today, um, have a read of this book. So once again, it might be useful to you if you are interested in researching historical millinery materials. So that's this one. And we come on to the last book for today, which is, this is quite a famous one, I think, um, From the Neck Up by Denise Dreyer. And I think it's quite famous because it's relatively modern. It was first published in 1981. And I think you can buy it directly from Denise herself online, which is, I think, how I bought it. So I bought it all the way from America. Um, and it's generally been recommended everywhere I go to a class or something. This book is always recommended. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to everyone. I think if you're quite a serious millinery student, then this is a good book for you. So essentially, if you're a serious millinery student, you might want to purchase... And maybe we'll, maybe we'll wrap the stream up by doing this. We'll, we'll do this better later. But if you're a serious millinery student, you might want to buy this one, the Georgina Kirke and From the Neck Up. But if you are a hobbyist, you might want to buy this one. And actually, this one, How to Make and Trim Your Own Hats, I think this makes a really good present because you can buy it as a print version. I think this is a reprint from Amazon, it might say on the inside. No, it's not a rep reprint from Amazon, but this is a republication of an original work. Um, but you can buy this as a book. And I think it makes a great present if you have a friend who is into sewing and making their own clothes and you want to get them interested in making hats. This is a really good present. So there you go. That's birthday sorted for all your friends. So yes. Um, back to this book and then we'll we'll wrap up afterwards. Rachel says this is the Bible of theatrical milliners. Yes, exactly. And I will show you exactly why it's the Bible of theatrical milliners because it essentially takes you through hats of all the ages. I think it might be at the end. Hang on. Is it at the end? Look at the end. It's got all of these patterns for different styles. You've got your Elizabethan women early 17th century man or a pilgrim's hat a soft cap for an early 17th century woman like if you're a modern milliner you're not necessarily going to be making these but if you're a theatrical milliner this is your bread and butter um oh this is just where i stopped reading this is my other bookmark um right post-it notes but this isn't a vintage book so it's okay <laughs> um ah this is the most helpful section that I found in this book out of all the other books. I think this is one of the only books that wrote about this technique in this way. So if you remember my video on making a kind of trilby bucket hat thing out of Melusine fur, I needed to make my own hat block for the brim. And for that, I needed to drape um, a brim. And this is how I did it. I did it following this pattern. Um, so that's particularly good. Um, it takes you through all the steps. And I thought this was also an interesting piece of information that we might not come to ourselves, but once it's presented to you, you kind of go, oh, obviously. So this illustration, the head size opening can be placed anywhere within the brim pattern to create different brim shapes. 
that's so obvious, but it's only when I saw it in this diagram that I went, oh, of course that's obvious. <laughs> so you see, so that was a useful section. And ah, this was the other section I found very useful. Um, we've already spoken today about, at the beginning of the stream, this stuff, the um, blocking net that I now think is called Maylene. The reason I have that is because currently blocking net, Paris net, Dior net is not being produced anywhere in the world, so I needed to find a different um, foundation for turbans and things, and I wanted to also look at previous turban foundations and figure out what's the next modern equivalent to that. So that's where I found this diagram particularly helpful, where it takes you through the different foundation materials used in millinery. So again, if you're interested in specific materials, this book is very good at explaining it. And let's just have a look at the last post-it that I have here, this blue one. Why did I have this blue one here? Who knows what I meant by this post-it? I mean, you've got your wire joins again. So if you were a student strapped for cash, then, and you wanted to buy serious studenty books and you were choosing between this one and the new one, buy the new one. Okay, let's answer some questions. What about contemporary styles or techniques? Have there been any 21st century innovations? Um, yes, so I've got I've got a stream coming up on more contemporary books. This this is all. Th I'll be honest. I would much rather read a vintage book than a modern book because I'm not really interested in contemporary millinery. I controversially think that there is no such thing as innovations in millinery because everything that we keep seeing, if you look far enough back it has already been done. So I don't think innovation is the right word. I think we see fashion cycles of things coming into fashion and out of fashion, and sometimes things come into fashion that are ancient. Um, except for morning millinery, we should bring that back. I mean, I don't think people should celebrate death. That would be awful. It's an awful thing to happen. But I think we should normalize the idea of a mourning period where we choose to potentially express ourselves by wearing fashion. Because I know that for me, having something to focus on when someone close to me dies um, is a good thing to do, whether that's work or maybe I start thinking about fashion. So um, that's my, my two controversial opinions. Um, Another question, why is it called Diornet? It's called Diornet because I think, well, it's also called Parisnet. It's got all these different names. There are, there are differences. Hang on. This book will tell us. This book will tell us because there are differences, I think. Let me just quickly scan through. Uh, middle row, Capenet, Parisnet. Ah, so here we go. So do you guys see this? Let me zoom in. And focus. Uh, why is it called Diornet? Uh, middle row, this is Cape Net, this one over here. You can see it's quite thick. So this is what I would say looks most like modern or what you used to be able to be able to buy in the modern world, uh, Diornet Paris Net. Then this next one is actually called Paris Net, a lightweight Cape Net no longer available. Which could potentially be this stuff but I still think this is Maylene because if we have a look at Georgina Kirke's definition of Maylene, uh, somewhere there is a definition. What was the definition? I don't think it was in the book. Um, but I seem to remember the definition of Maylene being a hexagonal honeycomb foundation material and this is what this is. You can see the little hexagons, whereas Dior or Paris Net is a diamond knitted structure. Oh, and now my hands are all sticky again. Um, it will be interesting to know what came first, the new materials or new styles? Yes, I see what you mean. Um,
so oh this net here yes uh is it to be used with a wireframe you can use it however you want i use it for um turban foundations so we were talking about this earlier on in the stream what to use for turban foundations now that there's no more access to dior or paris net um i use this stuff i have a video on trying to make my own dior or paris net um you can go and have a look at that and see if you thought i was successful or not you cannot buy this this is from a vintage sale i got this from uh, i don't think you can buy this from modern manufacturers this stuff i think is from the 80s which is when um the drea book was written so in fact maybe it's actually from the 50s and 60s because i bought it from a um shop called john boyd hats they were doing a general sale of materials that they had excess of and hat blocks and i saw that and i thought i know what that is i i need this um and you can see from this illustration or maybe you can't see but i will tell you what this illustration is it's little hexagons i think one second glasses 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 yes that looks like little hexagons to me yes very much so if you want to find out what different materials are this book's pretty good um yeah oh i meant to say also the types of styles that they go through in this book so there's lots of illustrations where are they all So dotted around are lots of these kind of illustrations which are not relevant to modern millinery but again if you're a um, theatrical hat maker then yes um, was John Boyd on Beauchamp Place yes they moved their shop they are now in I cannot remember the address but you can look them up lovely little shop you can go and visit them Yep, I think that's it. I don't think I have anything more to say. Oh, well, it goes through turbans. So once again, we were talking about turbans earlier. The patterns. Yep, that's everything. <laughs> that's all these books. And I've even run out of water just in time for the end of the stream. How are we all doing? Was that too much information? What books do you guys want to buy? <laughs> let me know either in the chat or in the comments and if you've got any more questions now is the time to ask before i sign off someone says fascinating thanks you're very welcome are you planning on buying any of these books michael says thanks so much for the info i am an avid reader so it's wonderful to add a few titles to the list Good for you. I've already found the how to make and trim your own hat PDF, so I'll be working through that. You will enjoy it. It's such a good read, that book, and the illustrations are really good. Wayne from the Haberdashery says, it was very informative and lovely. And um, I hesitate to read out your name. Um, I'm going to call you Honey, just because YouTube can be a bit funny. Um, so, Honey, what's your current fave hat shop in London? I don't know. I mean, I love John Boyd. Um, I love the people that work there and I love the hat shop. But I couldn't really say that I've been to many other hat shops in London. I mainly exist on the internet, being a millennial and never leaving my house. <laughs> um, have you ever... Do you ever look at books on the internet archive? Yes. That is, we started discussing that at the beginning of the stream. So once I sign off and the stream converts to a video on demand, a VOD, you can go and have a look back at the beginning of the stream and we'll chat a bit about that at the beginning. For you in the future, for me in the past. <laughs> oh, time. <laughs> um, other favorite hat shops? Um, 
some names that I like. Maybe I can give you. Maybe I can give you a list of um, milliners who I like to look at their work. Actually, so on Instagram, you can follow me on Instagram at Bylona Millinery, and other places. So, other milliners that I like in London. Do you know what? I start looking, and then all Instagram is is adverts. So I can't show you because. <laughs> I can't remember all the names off the top of my head. Um, but there we go. I think I should wrap this stream up because now we're just chatting about life rather than books. And um, if you'd like to do that, <laughs> message me. Oh, Rachel says, the only one I've been to in London was Lock & Co. I've been inside Lock & Co as well. I know it's, I think, one of the oldest hat shops in London, but I didn't really enjoy being in the shop. I'm just gonna leave that there. Um, Angela says, thank you, Alona, very informative. You're very welcome. I do like the designs in Lock & Co. I just didn't like being in the shop. I'll just clarify that. Um, right, well, thank you everyone for joining me on such a hot summer afternoon. I am all shiny. <laughs> I'm all shiny and frizzy. And I shall say goodbye to everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. If you'd like to see more of me, you can follow me on Instagram at Biolona Millinery. You can also support my work on Patreon. You can join and become a patron and enjoy monthly video call chats with me and the other patrons. And if you'd like to support me in another way, then you can also leave me a tip on Ko-fi and every tip goes towards the production costs of making these videos because lights, cameras are expensive. <laughs> so thank you so much for your support and thank you for watching me because that enables me to make these videos for you. If I didn't have an audience, I wouldn't be able to make these videos. Um, did I leave out a social media thing? I don't think I did. <laughs> okay, I'm signing off now. So lovely to chat to all of you today. See you next time. Bye.